From WGDR Plainfield and WGDH Hardwick, this is the Magical Mystery Tour. I'm Tony Epstein. Join us as we dive into the heart of things, exploring new ideas and new ways of seeing and being in this wondrous, crazy world we share together. My guest is Marguerite Mary Rigolosio. She's a scholar and priestess, the graduate and undergraduate teacher in the US and the UK. She's the founding director of the Seven Sisters Mystery School, which is dedicated to restoring knowledge about the sacred feminine and empowering people on their own spiritual journeys. She's the author of The Cult of Divine Birth in Ancient Greece and The Mother Goddesses of Antiquity and the mystery tradition of miraculous conception, Mary and the lineage of virgin births, which we had a fascinating conversation about a couple of years ago. And today we're gonna be talking about another fascinating subject. Guinevere, King Arthur, the round table and the fairy realm. Marguerite, welcome back to the Magical Mystery Tour. Thank you, Tonio. It's wonderful to be back with you again because I so enjoyed the conversation that we did. It was only a, about a year ago at this point, but it might seem like a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think everything seems a lot everything. longer these days. That's it. <laughs> so how did you go from the divine feminine and goddesses of antiquity and virgin birth to the Arthurian legends and the fey realm? And are they connected or actually I should ask, how are they connected since everything seems to be connected, especially these days? Yes, exactly. Um, And first we're going to let the listeners know that I am sitting in an outdoor setting. So they might be hearing planes and then just the general breeze. I'm, I'm sitting in an incredible fairy realm here, a wooded area with a beautiful patio. So, you know, all of these things, really started coming to me simultaneously. My interest in virgin birth, which we talked about in the last interview, actually is something that came to me as a downpour in 2001 when I when I received the downpour that virgin birth was an actual practice of holy women. And I had already been studying about Mother Mary, becoming, um, you know, having a personal relationship with her And then that realization and all of that research I was able to do allowed me to put together that Mary was an actual bona fide priestess of divine birth. And I also was looking into, you know, what I would call the Gnostic Jesus, of course, the mystical Jesus, because years before that, a decade or two before, I had been one of the pioneers um, to start talking about Mary Magdalene, and I had been teaching formal classes on her and the resurrection of who she really is. So I was very much into the Holy Family. I was very much into divine birth. And somewhere along the line, kind of around 20 years ago as well, I started tuning in more and more on the inner planes to Arthur, you know, the King Arthur times and Merlin. And I started to just receive intuitive impressions. And I had a partner at the time that was my teacher into sacred medicines. And so there was a tinge of of those energies that would be coming in. 
And then years into it, I started having the sense that Merlin, the, the great magician, was coming into my sessions to teach me esoteric concepts of time and things like that. And somewhere along the way, and I don't know how many years ago it was at this point, I started actually reading about the legends of Guinevere and Arthur and so forth. And when I read into their stories, I realized, oh my goodness, there are divine birth situations going on here. Arthur's birth, even Merlin's birth. And there was something that was supposed to have happened between him and Guinevere that apparently did not. So because I had all the codes, I was able to understand that this is a story that needs to be brought forth, which is what I'm bringing forth in my new course, you know, which is kind of one of the prompts of our interview. I'm, I'm doing a course that's starting live June 15th, and it's called Heal Yourself in Our World Through Reclaiming Guinevere, Arthur, the Fae, or the Fairies, and the Round Table. What is that? So as I started making these connections about divine birth, and I was going to England quite a bit for a number of years. And I think I was working out a lot of past life material. And I went to Glastonbury, you know, one of the supposed burial places. I went to Cornwall, one of the supposed birthplaces of Arthur. I went to Scotland and Venora's Mound and the museum, the Pict Museum, and that's one of the supposed burial places of Guinevere. And I realized that I had karma with all of this, with England, with Guinevere, with Arthur. And I really got the sense that Arthur was an iteration of Jesus, that he carried the Jesus energy and his divine birth facilitated that. He was in that, he was in that lineage. He was in that octave of Christed consciousness. And so from there, I started looking at, you know, what was Merlin's role in that whole divine conception business. And I started looking then most recently at Guinevere. I had had the sense in some of my medicine journeys that I have a connection with Guinevere. You might call me an emanation of her. In other words, it's not really a formal reincarnation. But like many people, when these beings are so big on the astral plane, they can fractalize and pieces of them can incarnate in other people. And I believe that that's what's happened for me with Guinevere. So I have a strong connection with her. And I felt that, you know, I was maybe having some extra knowledge. And so I had to deal with the stories about Lancelot, what was going on there? Was it true? Wasn't it true? And then recently I've come into the work of Lisa Renee, who I call her the queen of the oracles and her energetic synthesis site. And she's been having monthly blog audios where in several of them over the past year, she's been talking about that Arthur has woken up from stasis because there's been a longstanding legend that he just went to sleep and he was going to awaken when the people needed him again. So that Arthur has woken up from stasis and that this is corresponding with the generation of the Christ energy. And she feels that Guinevere's story was mishandled, that the story of her infidelity with Lancelot was a later invention. And it was kind of meant to mess up her reputation, just the way that Magdalene was called a whore. But that Guinevere herself is sort of an emanation of Magdalene and Mother Mary combined. So that's a, that's a kind of an interesting thing that we're going to be looking at in the class. So that's the, sort of the short story of how I perceive all of these things to be connected. Pretty wild, huh? I love it. I, I totally love it. You're talking about the sense of being an emanation of Guinevere. I can relate to that. I've had some of my own personal experiences of that sort of a thing in my own life yeah, from many years ago. So that totally resonates with me. And also, of course, in our culture, I have been fascinated by the Arthurian legend and right. all of that. So it's a wonderful story, not necessarily that it was accurately told through the, uh, the mediums that I found, like That's the right. books, like 
the once and future king and the yeah. mists of Avalon and right. things like that. Though they yeah. were immensely entertaining and inspiring in their own ways. Because what they do is they tune into the essence energy of it. And that's what everyone has done over the ages. All the writers, starting with the supposed historians of the Middle Ages, and, and there are some legends that go even earlier, some Welsh legends where Arthur and others are mentioned. But every generation of writers, whatever genre they've been writing in, whether it's supposedly a formal history or whether it's more like a romance, which happened later in the in the French tradition, they're all tapping into something that everyone taps into when you look into it. It's like everyone knows on some level. It's like there's some kind of memory there. The way there's a memory of Atlantis, there's the way there's a memory of Lemuria, the way there's a memory of maybe our Pleiadian connections or Andromedan connections, the way there's a memory of magic and Merlin and the fairies. You know, so the fairies wind in there, which I haven't mentioned yet, but I know we'll talk about it. So there is that fascination is not to be discounted. And that's really what I'm basing the course on that that fascination and our imagination around it is the living stream of that tradition. And it is alive and has medicine for us today. And it may be that we're in another rung of the spiral with it so that the story has migrated for the, I, what I've started realizing is that the story takes on the needs of the time. It migrates with the time. And so in the French time, they needed that courtly drama of Guinevere having the illicit affair with Lancelot to satisfy something in the courtly readers or maybe the women who were controlled about, wow, what, what happens when a woman says no and I don't want that, I want this? You know what I mean? So, but now what I'm saying, what Lisa Renee is saying is that that Lancelot story is a made up thing, maybe for that time. And now we need to unmake it up and we need to create a new story around it, which is one of the sacred, the happy sacred marriage. That's what mm -hmm. we're needing. That's the medicine that we're needing for this time. So, you know, these are, these are the things that are just under the surface. Whenever anyone starts seeing or hearing anything related, if you get fascinated, you have some kind of memory. And that makes me want to dive into the imaginal realm and, yes. and the relationship of the imaginal realm with our current consensus reality. And I would love for you to talk about the interrelationship and how all of these past memories or past realities, you know, whether they existed in a three-dimensional reality or whether they existed on other levels of other right. dimensions of experience that are perhaps outside of our current way of understanding things because we just naturally assume that the way we see things is the way things are but uh and always that, have been <laughs> and, and of course have always been and will very likely always continue to be <laughs> which is <laughs> pretty ridiculous considering if you you know if you do any studying of history the nature of history itself yeah. Even the history of science reveals that understanding and knowledge evolves and changes. Yeah. And there's this great story called Flatland. Are you aware of that? Oh, I had heard about it. Yeah. Where it's like two-dimensional or something. Yeah. Well, it, it starts out with in the two-dimensional world where yeah. they have an encounter with a three-dimensional being. Oh. And, then of, and then, of course, from there, you very naturally extrapolate into, well, what else could there be? So wow, I love that. So, yeah. So I would love for you to talk about the imaginal realm yeah. in relation to our realm, you know, in, in those terms. Yeah. And, you know, as, as always with us, you, you tune right in, which is what I so appreciate about you. And, you know, it, it just makes for a, 
we're on the same wavelength. Yes, you know, I, I have also taught a course on the fairies called Awakening to Our Fairy Kin. And I realized as I was preparing for that, and I was, I was really learning a lot about the fairies, the fae, which also includes the beings known as the she, S-I-D-H-E, which are kind of um, high elves of Tolkien race that seem to have come into that portal of the British Isles at some point in history, at some dimension of reality. And they are, they are considered by many the shining ones. They are godlike beings. And the Fae, they have been seen as, you know, fairies, the, the tall elves of Tolkien. They have been seen as related to the fairies, which are, you know, when we think of fairy, we think of more closely related to plant life flowers, trees, and rivers, streams, rocks, mountains, caves. But it's like there are many, many different races that have to do with the earth realm A phase shift away. Like we're in the same three-dimensional space, but they are in the fifth dimension. So we might not see them all the time, or we might only see their physical form like a flower. Like I believe a flower is the manifestation of a fairy in the third dimension. Mm -hmm. If you go into um, a reverie, a meditation, a sacred medicine journey, a dream, you might see the real essence of the being as its light form, right? So I started realizing that and, you know, one of my teachers for this was Jack Purcell, J-A-C-H. He channels a being known as Lazarus, who basically sounds like, you know, central casting, get me Merlin. <laughs> and um, I went to one of his fairy congresses and he just, we were all weeping. I mean, he, he was helping us reconnect with our fairy friend on the other side. And it was a really interesting process that then, you know, I took and adapted and and teach, which is that the imagination is part of it. It's not just, you know, and that's what the fairies are all about. Imagination is not a bad thing. It's not a non-reality. You know, just like fiction, we call it kind of a non-reality or myth. People think of fiction and myth as non-realities, but in fact, they are co-created realities in their own dimension. And the same thing that can happen, in fact, it's how you communicate with the fairy realm, which is, the birds are very active right now, which is, <laughs> which is um, how you communicate across the veil is through the imaginal, what we're calling the imaginal realm, which I say is part imagination, part your creation, and part something that has ontological reality of its own. So you're working with both and something that's statically in existence and something that you're in a kind of a co-creation with. And that's the fairy realm. That's play. That's manifestation. You know, so people are like, people sort of understood in that workshop. And then when I teach this, you understand that you're in this co-creational realm to meet and or co-create your fairy ally. And then there is that reality. And then there is that relationship. So in a sense, we could consider many things on the, in the other dimension as being part of the imaginal realm. And in a sense, then malleable by our thoughts and by our realities. So it's like in this class, we're going to be looking at the whole Arthurian Guinevereian legend from the imaginal realm, which is different from Jeffrey of Monmouth said, you know, Chrétien of Troy said, it's more like, wow, let's move into what we all collectively sense about these beings and let's play with them. Let's receive in the intuitive faculty what they're about and let's play with new stories about them, you know, and they are directly related to the fairy realm because as I'm going to be discussing there's a strong possibility that Guinevere is a fairy queen. And in fact, that Arthur has fairy background and certainly dragon 
background, which is another, of course, misunderstood type of being that features very largely into this story. So that's a little bit about, you know, musing on the imaginal realm for what we're talking about here today. And Jung spoke of the imaginal realm as being as real as this realm. Ah, uh, yeah. And the thing that's so interesting, it's like it's even really coming in as I'm talking to you, is that it has ontological reality, right? Meaning it is real in and of itself. It has laws and things like that. But the laws are so malleable once we get into the picture and start entering into it. It just becomes like a kid's playground, like a finger painting kind <laughs> it's crea- it's the realm of creativity that's mm-hmm. the point of it it is the realm of creativity it allows for creativity it is creativity itself it is the funnel by which creativity comes into this dimension right mm-hmm. that we're creatively taking another look at avalon at the place time space of these beings, which again, and you you were talking about, right, is it third dimension? Is it fifth dimension? I do tend to think that these beings had a third dimensional walk upon the earth, at least one. I'm not sure when that was. Was it the fifth or sixth century when they're pinned, you know, into the historical timeline? Or was it earlier in prehistory you know did they really far predate jesus because what lisa renee is saying is is that they are part of an essene lineage that was already up in the british isles having migrated up there which is a christ sophia consciousness group if you will it's a substratum on the earth plane of people who really held that christ sophia consciousness and they had already gone up. That's why early Celtic Christianity is so weird and strange. It's almost like, well, how did it get Christian so early over there, you know? (laughs) And, you know, before, you know, there's a strange history where the Romans went in all during those first centuries of the Common Era, but then it didn't get formally Christianized until the Archbishop of Canterbury went over there and more like the Middle Ages, you know? So, all prior to that, you're dealing with what they're calling Celtic Christianity, but it's really this amalgam of probably this this Essene consciousness with the prehistoric, so to speak, nature-based fairy religion. Mm-hmm. As you're talking about that, it makes me reflect on you know the nature of history mm-hmm. and how it's probably a lot more nebulous than we think in terms yes. of dimensionality. Yeah, that's right, because even, let's say, if they walked the plane, the third dimensional plane, they certainly were cavorting with the interdimensional planes a lot. Right, it would have been very different than our experience of it, most likely. That's right, because the earliest wars that Arthur was doing were really against, like, serpent-headed beings and, you know, essentially the lizard people of the disclosure movement, you know, serpent headed beings, dog and cat headed beings, you know, evil sorcerers and and so forth. Right. So he was already battling on the inner dimensions. You know, let's call him a male version of Kali, that goddess who is battling demons. And I think there was a lot of demonic battling that Arthur was involved in, in order to help protect the earth plane because it was being besieged over the past several thousand years by these negative entities. And it's turned an Eden into an AI playground and a place of suffering and trauma. So Arthur and Jesus and, you know, the women involved were really high level dedicated beings coming to the earth plane to help out, right? And so I have considered whether they may have been exclusively on the inner dimensions, like whether this story is completely a she story. And 
whether they may have been mainly cavorting on that level or not. And I think that's really fascinating to think about. What does that mean? Where does that locate them in space and time? This is why they talk about the Middle Earth. Tolkien talks about the Middle Earth. And it is said that the she went into the earth after they kind of lost battles or whatever um, by these negative beings and so forth. They went into the earth. So what does that mean? Well, gosh, did they just go into an interior dimension? Or are they literally physically inside the earth? These are the, these are the areas we get to when we start talking about all this. And there's, of course, talks about the veils between dimensions. And back in earlier times, there may not have been any veils between the dimensions. That's there may have right. been a much more fluid um, exactly. dimensionality. Exactly. And I think that's really that we've hit it on the head. That is how Guinevere could have come in as a fairy queen and be cavorting with what may well have been a more physically embodied man in the form of Arthur. Right. And so many more things were possible because there weren't fixed boundaries, fixed veils or right. things that separated the world the way we have. And I think a lot of the separation that we have comes from the development of our frontal cortex and the way we think, and mm -hmm. also the way our thinking has evolved since developing that part of our brain. Yeah, and that could have a lot to do with interdimensional hybriding of the human form. Deliberate experiments, manipulations, because a lot of people in the disclosure movement are talking about that there have been at 25 or more manipulations, seedings, hijackings of the human being. And that part of what we're doing is trying to get back to the original template that is, I believe, encoded in our DNA. We have to wake up the junk DNA in order to do it and put maybe some other stuff to sleep. And so that's part of what's going on today. So this course is not as much historical as it is what's going on today and how do we how do we do all that? How do we work with the Fae? How do we redevelop our fairy site? How do we adjust our DNA? How do we work with the inner grail of light? How do we go into the castle? How do we understand and work with the round table as a technology? And, you know, how do we re-enchant our world? Because it, it's, it's practical in that it's environmentally salvific to do all of this. And it's also, it brings beauty and joy and magic back to our lives, which is sorely missing for people and is something that people end up seeking out through opening their consciousness through alcohol, you know, through various other chemicals and so forth. But those chemicals can never really, you know, they can partway open you, but they open you enough to get negative entities coming into your space. But it's not the real thing that people are seeking. And that's what Ireland is left with. They're left with, you know, a drunken situation. So they've gone from their original connectivity to these realms and the fairies. And there's so much lore. I mean, there's lore written about all the beliefs about the fairy and human interactions over the centuries, interbreedings and so forth. And then Ireland had the dragons taken away under the guise of we're getting the bad guys away, but that isn't what happened at all. There's a confusion between the bad guys, which looked a lot like dragons and the dragons. The dragons got sent away, so the protectors got sent away. And then what's in its place is excessive alcohol and a suppressive Christianity. And so I'm talking about the Irish needing to return the dragons, call them back. So yeah, I'll just pause there. And also not to confuse the effects of alcohol with plant medicine, other plant medicines. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Because plant medicines can be very useful particularly in their original unadulterated form. 
the problem is that so many of them are getting hybrided as well. And when mm -hmm. they're getting hybrided, they're getting controlled and hijacked. And then people end up having different types of experiences with them. And those realms get monitored, influenced, hijacked, and controlled. So people working in those realms have to be very careful because it's not all, you know, the fairy paradise that it once was. There's a lot of underworldly stuff and you have to get very, very sophisticated in your knowledge about the negative side to know what you're dealing with so as not to be taken over. Well, there's, there are many spiritual traditions that talk about how the life journey is the unraveling of our past conditioning or our traumas and things like that. And a lot of what you're talking about is negative influences and negative entities. I, I'm kind of, I'm thinking of them as being other dimensional kind of manifestations of the kind of experiences that we're having in this world that we just have to do the work to unravel and to heal them and to individuate ourselves from in a healthy way and make ourselves whole in relation to the wholeness of all that is. Yes, that's what is happening on planet Earth right now. This is a very great time for that integration and that ascension, or what I call incension, because it's an inside job. <laughs> and that's really, you know, the larger purpose of the course is to go deeper into that through the vehicle of the Christo Sophia as it is expressed in the Guinevere Arthur connection and the fairies. You know, I've been thinking long and hard about the relationship between entities on the inner dimensions and people's suffering, largely emotional and trauma. And, you know, where I am with it now is that this is a planet where a lot of trauma has been inculcated because the negative, yeah, there's an example of it, <laughs> that sound, mm -hmm. underworldly weird, you know, this dimension has been really infiltrated by negative beings who love to create and foment trauma in the human being, in the human light body, emotional body, and so forth, because negative emotions feed them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fear. It's fear, fear is a big, yeah. loathing, shame, yep. um, anger, you know, all those things. And in the sexual realm, there's a whole host of things that can go on. So they create gashes in the light, the human light body, starting from the get go. It can be even through conception, but certainly in utero, there are many things that can happen that can traumatize a child and certainly in birth where the way they've designed the birthing process for the most part is a trauma-based medicalized situation where it is not promoting peace and harmony. And it is using surgical implements. It's cutting off the umbilical cord, which shouldn't happen. It's doing circumcisions, which shouldn't happen. You know, all these types of things that bring fear, trauma, and violence to the child immediately. So it starts then and then it goes on with whatever intergenerational stuff has already been going on. And then you're healing from it for the rest of your life. But all those holes that have been created in your auric field are the places where these beings can come in and continue to twist the knife and make you feel badly, have thoughts that you don't want. And then this control is all throughout the whole system, the whole land, the mind control, the media, the memes that get put out there. I mean, it's it's a pretty sophisticated level of technology that these beings are doing with us to manipulate us. And half the time, we don't know why we're really feeling what we're feeling or thinking. And we're trying to gain mastery over our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our emotions. And again, you know, this work with one of you and Arthur is going to be part of that with the fairies. They really are here to help us. So you're suggesting that 
the institutionalization of patriarchy and male domination had an otherworldly origin? Absolutely. And it's not really men's fault. They got hijacked as much as anything by these beings who have negative male valence in the universal schema. They are not respecters of the sacred womb of Sophia. They rape it, they hijack it, and they try to create artificial means to promote their own conceptions and birthings and breeding and so forth, rather than respecting the laws of the natural universe. So what would you think of the notion of them serving the function of being challenges along the way in our own personal development? You know, it's always kind of a both and thing. And there probably isn't a person on the planet who didn't choose to be here. So, yes, it, it, what we're having on planet Earth is one of the deepest initiations into the underworld that you can have. And therefore, you understand the negative side of reality. And you become fully initiated into the light and the dark. And this is Sophia. She has knowledge of good and evil, positive and negative. She carries both, but she's 51% for the positive, just like the right. archangels. Right. Okay. So, yes, we are going through this. Now, what's happening, though, is people need an assist because most people don't know what the heck is going on. They are not being given the means and the information of how they can ascend themselves. And then you have, you know, I just recently went on to a boardwalk at a city down in a specific state on the East Coast. And it was so low vibrational. You know, there were there were drunk people, people wasted out of their minds, vomiting. And I mean, it was crazy. And so when you see things like that, you're like, wow. We're all suffering, but you know, how many lives are they going to have to go through before they get that information? You know, talk about privilege, you know, they're, they're not privileged to be accessing it and they're kept down through this crappy Velveeta junk food that they're being shown as food, you know, all that programming. I mean, the food was like a, a nightmare. But you did say that, I mean, you did acknowledge that everyone did make the choice to come they here did. and they subject did. themselves to these challenges. And there's also the possibility that we could come, you know, reach a level where we can thank these negative entities for serving this dark negative role yeah. that challenges us to grow and become, yeah. you know, return to who we most truly and fully are. Yeah, and basically that's the hero's and Hera's journey. Mm -hmm. And that is what we're involved in. That is what we've chosen. That said, it's gotten a bit much. Well, yeah, it, it is a bit much. and we're... It's gotten a bit much. It's gotten more <laughs> beyond what it really was supposed to be. And so it takes extra stamina. To well, how can, but how can we possibly say it's gotten to be more than it was supposed to be? Because as some people, like, Byron Katie, I love the way she talks about these things that how do you know the way things are supposed to be? Just look at the world. That's it. This is it. It can't be anything other than what it is right now. Well, that's where part of the mission is to get it to a different place. Oh, yeah. That's part of the Christ Sophia mission. Well, part that's of part of the, the challenge. Three yep. mission. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, we don't it's, want to get stuck in like, oh, well, we're all just learning and that's great and let's just go through it. Um, we want to assist with the suffering. We, we want to return it to an Eden realm. And right. yes, you know, perhaps we've had to go through this negative portal that included the closing down and the shutting down or the going to sleep of Avalon, you know, the age and the domain of Arthur Guinevere. Um, it is a deep philosophical question. I mean, you will always learn. And, and the deeper and the more intense and horrific 
the initiation you go through, if you can make it through to the other side, yes, you will gain much in the way of wisdom. But my understanding is that on the interdimensional realm, there are beings of light that are horrified as to what's going on. They're like, no, this is, this is a rampant taking advantage of a planet that needs to stop. It's basically breaking cosmic law. And this has been going on for a while when, when you hear in biblical references to the sons of God cavorting with the daughters of man and, and interdimensionally breeding, and that's a breach of cosmic law. You know, so there's illegalities that have been going on and we can't just sit here and go, well, let's all just take it, you know? No, because for some of us, part of the journey is to be the warriors of the truth and, and be the warriors of light to assist ourselves and others in getting out of this so that it can be easier for others. Yeah, of course. Because we're at the nadir point. We're at the we're at the most negative point, according to many. And we we've got to get ourselves out of this pit and back up. So that's the process that's happening. And of course, like you know, what I'm offering is part of what, what we're doing with that along the way to help ourselves and to help others. Well, yeah, the, the times that we're in are the great challenge that yeah that we have to fully acknowledge as it is yeah. in order to, to help us rise to the challenge. Yeah. So it's not, a, it's certainly not about accepting what is and just, you know, laying down and, and giving up. Yeah. It's about acknowledging the truth of what's happening and how we're experiencing it in our, in our own beings and emotional and psychological responses to that when we see the suffering of so many others around us which helps to inform us to rise to to the challenges that we're facing and and yeah we're at yeah. we're at and a critical point yeah exactly and you know tonio this is where the fairies come in they really are about light levity laughter play creativity fun yeah i love that part remembering to dance even in the face of terrible suffering and pain and horror because yeah. many people who have lived through the greatest horrors have talked about just that that that's really the only way to to maintain our humanity in the face of that that's right and you know it may be that in this great initiation that many of us are going through or consciously the fairies are just reminding us they're they're giving us an assistance they the Essene lineage of the inner and outer planes, you know, of the Christ Sophia consciousness, they are saying, hey, we know it's tough. We know you're hanging on by a thread and, you know, with your fingernails on the cliff. We know you're working really hard here. You're, you're up against a lot of stuff that we dealt with too. And part of what's needing to happen now is you're awakening to the fact that we are here to help you. So that's a theme of the course too, you know, they are here to help us. How do we access their help? And what do we do with it? And we need all the help we can get at this point. We do, we do because it's coming fast and furiously. And, you know, some people are thinking that the timeline is set that there's going to be the restitution of the world the way we want it but it's a little dicey as to how we're getting there and and some people are nervous quite frankly because of the onslaught of the artificial intelligence energy that's the real to me scary part because it's it's an anti-life energy and that's what's at the bottom of all of this techno wizardry that seems to be increasingly weird. And on the one hand, we're being told is helping us. Yet then when you look deeper into it, it's like, hey, you know, that energy causes all sorts of diseases, you know. 
yeah. there's a huge challenge with any new technology that we create, however it's created, like mm. a great example, of course, is atomic energy and what and, we did you know, with that. Yeah, and there's a question whether atomic energy is a violation of universal law in and of itself. You see what I mean? Well, it's interesting how there have been lots of testimony within the the military witness testimony of seeing extraterrestrial craft coming to these uh, nuclear sites and actually turning them off. Yeah, yeah, because they're like, this is messed up. And <laughs> also being told that they would not allow us to destroy ourselves with our nuclear technology, that other than that, they would they would not interfere in our affairs down here, but they would not let us destroy ourselves. Right. The only issue is that when they continue to detonate these tests, they rip a hole in the time-space continuum, and that allows the pouring through into this dimension of even more of these negative beings. It's, it's pretty dire, and it's pretty intense. Yeah, I don't really know anything about those kind of negative things that you're talking about, but mm -hmm. all of these things are double-edged swords. Everything is, a, in a sense, is a double-edged sword. They can work mm -hmm. against us, but they can also work in our favor, depending on how we rise to the challenge and the way we, well, particularly rising to the challenge of doing our own inner work. That's with, the thing. With, with everything. Because that's the thing. That's the one thing that, that cannot be taken from us. We can be affected in ways that that distract us from it yes. for perhaps many lifetimes. Yes. But inevitably, the wholeness of all that is, is an integral being, including all of the dark negative elements in it. And so we're waking up and we're clearing out what doesn't need to be there. And we are enlivening what we do want there. We're reforming ourselves and we're reforming the earth. Mm -hmm. And we are doing that in conjunction, ideally, with the fairy beings who are, again, have many races, but that, that race of the she are very sophisticated, interdimensional light worker travelers, the shining ones, the holy ones. So I would love for you to talk about how we can work with them and how they can help us to do this work our inner spiritual work and our outer work of stewardship and responsibility in this world. Yes, that's right, because that's where we've got to focus. You know, there are numerous ways. I mean, for example, in the course, we're going to be working specifically with the leprechauns because, of course, they were infantilized and, you know, turned into like Lucky Charms characters and whatever. But they really are all about manifestation wealth and true wealth and that that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow so we're going to be working with that we're going to be working with rainbow energies in a number of different ways and you know one of the things to do is to simply go outside to places that are enchanted that feel enchanted recognize their enchantment sit in them meditate in them let it shift your whole energy field and your body and just start having imaginative conversations with the beings in this dimension. Another one is meeting your fairy ally, you know, through my course, Awakening to Our Fairy Kin, meet with your fairy ally and then have a relationship with it. I have two. These beings have helped me so much. Oh my God. You know, I have these inner dialogues with them and they've given me life direction and you know i mean it's stuff that is not exactly in my conscious mind like i'll ask a question it'll be like boom so you can begin communicating with them you know so these are these are just the ways literally going out in nature appreciating it drinking of its essence connecting with the fey that are just on the other side of the veil finding your fey and she allies developing relationships with them talking to them Asking them how to bring more fun, joy, and pleasure into your life. Following up on what they say. You know, these are all ways of getting into it that way. And then, of course, there's the whole Christ Sophia energy, which is the cultivation of the heart. 
the healing of the wounds, the opening of the sacred heart, the calling on these great beings, you know, the Christ Sophia family to assist you whenever you are having difficulties, asking them for advice, asking them to hold you, asking them to reparent you, if you will, even I do that. And if, if you don't resonate with the Holy Family, then find the interdimensional federation that you do resonate with. You know, maybe it's the Kuan Yin's, right? And so forth. So we can, we can be working through our meditation, through our inner dialogues with these beings. We can be asking for dreams and paying attention to our dreams. I mean, I only see the fairies in the dreams. I've seen gnomes and things like that. We can use sacred medicine specifically to invoke working with the Fay, she, and or Christ Sophia Essene lineage for assistance with our lives and for assistance with our ministry. So these are just some of the ways. It's really endless. And I talk a lot about that and I work with people a lot. I take them on guided meditations to work with Mother Mary once a month. You know, I have my Mother Mary Love and Empowerments Circle, and those are profound, profound journeys that we do together third Thursday every month. And we're going to be doing more of that kind of thing in the course that I mentioned. You know, heal yourself in our world by reclaiming Guinevere, Arthur, the Fae, and the Round Table. So this is very shamanic-like, and this is like the Western tradition of of that. It's the Western Mystery School which is something that I have not really had much connection with. Although you brought up dragons and I would love for you to talk more about dragons because many years ago in my twenties, I did a year at the Imaginal College in San Diego. And during that time we were doing a lot of imaginal work and there was a lot about dragons coming up within me Yeah, that had a very powerful presence in my experience. Oh, and, yeah. I, and I had really little or no context to really understand that. Right. And yeah. still really don't. Yeah. This is another major thing that we are reawakening to on the planet. This dragon lore and this information has been in subterranean realms of the Western tradition, especially the Celtic tradition. Even in the Greek tradition, you, you have talk of the Drakaina, the dragon who guarded Delphi. The Chinese have it big time. So you can find mention of these beings in probably every indigenous lore around the world, every indigenous tradition. And then what you're starting to hear now through spiritual oracles and, you know, the fairy people, the the people who are really organizations that are really trying to help people connect with the fairies, there are courses on what they are. There's a whole oracle deck i'm forgetting the woman's name to help you get to know the various types of dragons i just took a course just a a brief workshop for the fairy and human relations congress that was back in january that's probably still accessible through their website on the dragons and that there are dragons of all four elements and of the ethers there are earth dragons there are cosmic dragons you know, there are, again, many, many races of these beings and somebody who is has been awakening many more people in the esoteric spiritual community, New Age, if you will, is Kaya Ra and her book, The Sophia Code, where she talks about the Sophia dragon tribe and how these dragons are intimately connected with the Sophia consciousness. And... So these are telluric energies that are in the earth plane. They cavort within. They are, they are both in motion and they are static. Like if you look at a, a mountain, you can sense a dragon. I've gone walking in different places, in various places, but in Western Mass. And I'll be up in these Appalachian mountain trails. And I'm like, oh, you see a, a rock formation that has a dragon head. And a long body. And it's like, well, there's a dragon right there. You see pokings out of trees. And you're like, wow, if my imagination hat were on, that would look like a dragon. And it's like, well, that is a dragon. So how about saying hello? And then there's the whole process whereby women can be used to repopulate the earth with dragons. 
if they consciously birth dragon golden eggs into the earth. Or you can go and hug a tree and let an interdimensional dragon come through you into the earth. But you want to make sure you are asking for only dragons of love, light, and wisdom and no other beings, right? Because there's commerce that's going on now as these dragons are awakening from stasis and so many of them have been decimated, they need to be repopulated. So, you know, that's a little bit of a beginning of understanding of dragons. And then again, it's the type of thing where in your meditations, in your dreams, in your medicine journeys, ask about them. Go, go on imaginative journeys. See, what are they saying? Meet your dragon ally. That's one of the other things I have, pe your dragon protector. That's one of the other things I have people do in my awakening to our fairy kin course. And then work with that being. Have it wind around your body to protect you. Have it encircle your property. Yeah, I think I've been doing a lot of that work without connecting it to dragons. Back then, I just felt like there was this tremendous power inside of me. And as a person who has experienced a lot of trauma in my own life and seen it in other people's lives and seen other people subjected to it, I was afraid of that power inside of me because I knew that I didn't have the wisdom to contain it in a way that that would, I was just afraid that, that I would end up causing harm to others if I was to actually wield that power. So I right. very deliberately did not allow it to fully embody in me. Well, now there's a whole bunch of information coming out on dragons that you can look into and begin to work with them. Because, yeah, we many of us have past life memories of either ourselves or others who misused that tremendous power. And we, we made contracts that we're not going to do that again. So it's there, but it's held in abeyance until we understand what it is and get our Merlin into our life, our guide, our priest, teacher to help us. So call in Merlin. Antonio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's what my life has been. And in this world, we see tons of evidence of people misusing that power in, oh, in the world. That's right. The whole thing of what's been going on over the past two years is the misuse of that power. Well, for a couple of thousand years. Well, yes. 16, 1700 years, especially. Yeah. Especially. Yeah. And it's manifesting in spades in our political system and in our economic system. Yeah, because it's the forces that look like dragons that are AI facsimiles of dragons that are doing this. And that's the grand confusion that happened. So it's disconnected energy, yeah. essentially. That it is connected from the feminine life force, Sophia Womb. Mm -hmm. Disconnected from the heart. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're working with, you know, at another iteration. I mean, a lot of my work over the past 10 years of running Seven Sisters Mystery School and, you know, creating the courses and things has been different iterations of going deeper and deeper and deeper. And so as I grow, I bring some of that into what I'm teaching. And so this is the culmination to date of what I'm about is this course on Guinevere and Arthur. So. Over the past few decades, there are people who talk about, quote unquote, star seeds and indigo, was indigo children, now it's indigo children and indigo people, and other such terms. What is your understanding of, of that in relation to the fairy realms and she people and, and what we've been talking about? Right. Well, one thing... I meant to mention a while ago in the conversation, but haven't, is that I have given readings to hundreds of people over 10 years. Maybe I'm more than a thousand people now. I don't know. And I've taught and I see a lot of people come through my Zoom screen. And I started realizing years ago that there were literal human fairy hybrids. And what that means is that the fairy DNA that is already part of human DNA was more prominent for these people. So they start looking like, guess what, you know, beings from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> and I mean, it would be striking. I would be like, whoa, do you 
have any connection with the fairies and they usually burst into tears. And they're like, yes, as a child, blah, blah, blah. Or yes, I absolutely, blah, blah, blah. I mean, honestly, I don't even think there's one person that I've ever brought it up with who didn't suddenly cry because they were being seen in this aspect. So I started writing about human fairy hybrids and their gifts and their challenges because it's not that easy when you're high valence fairy in this lifetime, you sometimes you'll be extra attacked by the forces when you're parachuting in and you will sometimes have physical problems. You'll sometimes have problems dealing with the monetary system. It just doesn't make sense to you. Problems really being in your body and grounding and things like that. So I see a lot of human fairy hybrids. So that's one manifestation of these beings in human body. And like I said, it's kind of been here all along, this fairy DNA. And really, in a sense, DNA from all of these visiting cultures, planets, star systems, whatever, are in our DNA. We can selectively start turning on more of it. We all have Pleiadian DNA. You know, I figured that out years ago when I started understanding the talks and the information about the Pleiades in indigenous traditions and so forth. So the starseed lightworker phenomenon is just incarnating souls. I think it's some people who, who are recycling through the reincarnational time, but it's timed that a larger proportion of them are on the more like higher vibrational level now. And then it may also be that these other beings from other realms are going, wow, I got to go in and help the earth plane now. I got to incarnate. And as we talked about last time, the highest version of that is brought through virgin birth or high tantric sacred marriage practices. But what I'm seeing is that there are a lot of starseed high beings coming in through the normal channels now. And they're all about us. They've already been born. You know, it's been different generational levels. And now apparently a lot of the children coming in have that energy. So this is all designed to help us all raise the vibration of this planet, get us all to release some of this negativity and return to a positive Eden where learning can happen through positive energy and not necessarily travail and, you know, the hell realms. Mm -hmm. And throughout my life, I've been drawn to those kind of people and okay. they've been drawn to me. Yeah. Yeah, because you're already in that vibration. I mean, I could tell by when we had our conversation, it's like, wow, soul kin. You know, you're, you're somebody who really gets it. But it took me many, many years to really come into the more confident sense of that in myself, whereas I was still drawing these people to me and also being drawn to them as if magnetically drawn to create these supportive and healing communities. Or perhaps, you know, some people talk about soulmate communities where yeah. we have come into this world to work together to, to help each other. Yeah. But to me, it's the most delicious experience encountering people like these and, yeah. and connecting with them. That's right. And that's part of your fairy magic. You're putting it out there on some level. And it's like, lo and behold, look who's showing up. Not to mention the fact that, you know, as Rudolf Steiner suggests, we do tend to reincarnate with our soul family or, you know, and people that we need to reconcile things with. So that's part of what's happening. And yet you're expanding it far and wide. You're drawing many, many people to you. And with this podcast and so forth, that's part of your ministry is to like use the airwaves to get messages out there of healing and illumination and inspiration and to draw more people to you. And one of the things that's most deeply heartening for me is to encounter young people who are at this level of understanding and embodied experience. That's right. Des despite the fact that they're also, at the same time, they've also gone through tremendous trauma, but yeah. they've gone through it and yeah. have come through it much quicker than than like me, for example. I know because we're the we're the earlier generations. And now, you know what I'm getting as we're talking? 
is that there are academies, interdimensional academies, where souls are trained. It's almost like a military operation where they go through different types of excruciating ordeals that mimic what could go on on planet Earth and so that they're prepared at the soul level for when they're coming in and then they can move through it more quickly. I've never seen that before, but that's what I'm getting as we're talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I had a very, very dear close friend back when I was very young who was like that, who was six years younger than me. And she was very high being. Yeah. And yet she was also going through some major challenges at the same time. Yeah. But uh, there was something about her that that literally short circuited all of my negative tendencies so that I could not manifest any of my, you know, trauma based trips with her. Wow. <laughs> and it was amazing because it was it was starkly obvious. Yeah. That that I just didn't respond to things she did in the way that I would if somebody else did, <laughs> did yeah. any of those things. Yeah. Because she already had that star academy healing energy coming in you know she she was a being that that carried that healing energy on some level mm -hmm. and she was very psychic yeah and right see there you go a lot of times that's part of the <laughs> that's part of the profile mm -hmm. of these star seed people and i learned a lot just from observing her like she would retreat i lived in a house in a large house with eight other people and she was living there her mother lived there and she would retreat into her bedroom for periods of time and not come out and whenever she needed to do that she would just withdraw she had such a strong inner self-guidance system that blew my mind wow there you go <laughs> so we have we have wonderful teachers all around us in in all kinds of forms, don't we? That's right. It's so exciting to see human beings have these superpowers. Yep. And not necessarily have to, you know, be divinely born through a really difficult process of a priestess doing divine birth. <laughs> right, because there may not be enough of uh, people like that to right. uh, to save the world. That's right. The codes may not be complete for that to happen in an integral way for a while. And meanwhile, the point is anyway, for all of us to be that second coming, that's the point. Right. And that's part of the, the Guinevere Arthur course is it's a further iteration of what does it mean for you to be the second coming? Right, that once and future king thing. That once and, and future king. And also in, in the Buddhist tradition, they talk about the Buddha, you know, coming again at the same time. Right. And I recently heard that Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a very well-known Vietnamese Buddhist, says that the Buddha to come will actually be all of us together. That's, see, it's the same message, the same teaching. That's right. Yeah. yeah. The Christ Sophia, it's all of us. That's that second coming. The Arthur waking out of stasis, it's the same thing. You can pick your octave iteration of who you want to work with to help you the most. Is it Buddha? Is it Jesus and, you know, the Marys? Is it Arthur and Guinevere? There are different flavors and levels of it. And, you know, many other traditions would have their own vibration of this. But when you look at the state of the world right now and the direction that we're headed at this seemingly exponentially increasing speed, it's, it's hard to reconcile how that course could be changed in that That's way. right. That's, that's why, I mean, I do feel heartened by what oracles are saying. They're saying that, no, the positive timeline is there. It's just going to look gnarly. But because we're never 100% sure, it does light a fire under us. And so that fire has got to get us moving quickly now. We've got to move quickly. There is, to my mind, a kind of an urgency which is why I keep teaching the various iterations of what I'm teaching and why, you know, many people are feeling now, holy gosh, we've got to do this. And when we have got to do this, that means we've got to do the inner work, like you're saying. And you'll be shown, I mean, if you're still with some wounds that are hanging out and causing trouble, whoa, you're going to see it immediately. You're going to have to deal with it. And then you're going to have to work with 
your community somehow, your collective. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So for people who resonate with your work, how can they find out more about you and this course that you're offering? And again, remind us again what, what this new course that you're going to do. Yes, it's called Heal Yourself and Our World by Reclaiming Guinevere, Arthur, the Fay, and the Round Table. And it's going to be live four Wednesdays starting June 15th, 2022, but it will remain available in replay for registration on demand indefinitely into the future. So if people are listening to this beforehand, they can join us live. If they're listening to it afterward, you just go to seven sisters mystery school.com. The seven is written out S E V E N go to the home page and you'll either see it listed right on the home page or just go into the online courses tab and it will be in the drop down menu and just click onto that. You'll find out more and you can register. We hope that anybody feeling intrigued and you know inspired by this will join us because now is really the time. So one thing we didn't touch on was the round table. Right. Would you like to talk about that? I'll give a little taster on it. Okay. It's it's an inner technology. <laughs> it's an outer it's an outer form as well, but it's an inner technology. And so, you know, I want to start everybody's imagination thinking, well, what would an inner technology round table be? And what might it do? What might it accomplish? Well, look at the qualities and characteristics of a round table and people sitting around it. And it's a round. You know, what happens with a round? Can it spin? You know, where can you put it? What if you put it in different chakras? What does that do? Right. You know, and what if we do a visualization with it in the interior realms? What are we doing with it? Right. So those are the kinds of things that we're going to look at. It's a tool for healing and unity consciousness. That's very interesting because back when I was having those experiences with dragons and dragon mm -hmm. energy, I was also getting lots and lots of circles in yeah. many different forms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there you go. There's the round table of Guinevere. He brought that into the marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so keep playing with them. Uh -huh. ask, ask them what they are telling you. And I think it also fits with what we were just talking about earlier of the becoming of the Christ or, or the Buddha as being all of us. There's, yeah. there's the round table again. That's right. That round embrace. Everyone's at the table. Right. The round wholeness of everything. That's right. So, you know, People just start getting their minds on that and, and let your imagination roam and let your heart awaken, let yeah. your eyes open. Yeah. Well, yeah. once again, Marguerite, it's been wonderful to talk with you. Tonio, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for your really wonderful questions that helps us go deeper and broader. I hope everybody has enjoyed this and has had their imagination sparked and that it's either validating or inspiring them to go further. Yep, me too. <laughs> That's yeah. my hope. Yeah. yeah. So again, thank you so much for being on the Magical Mystery Tour again. You're welcome. And be well and blessings to you and everyone, all of us. Yes, yes. God bless us, everyone. <laughs> and goddess bless us. <laughs> exactly. I lean in that direction myself. Yeah, yeah, that's needed. That's part of it. All right, Tonio. Well, bye for now. Bye bye. Bye. My guest has been Marguerite Mary Rigolosio. She's a scholar and priestess. She's the founding director of the Seven Sisters Mystery School, which is dedicated to restoring knowledge about the sacred feminine and empowering people on their own spiritual journeys. She's the author of The Cult of Divine Birth in Ancient Greece and The Mother Goddesses of Antiquity and The Mystery Tradition of Miraculous Conception, 
Mary, and the lineage of virgin births. And that's it for this Magical Mystery Tour. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, take good care of yourselves and each other. <laughs>